All right. Um, so this presentation is shared logging with the Linux kernel. Um, if you were there in Dublin, uh, I did an initial presentation on this. Uh, so this is actually a follow-up. Um, first, last time I, I had managed to skip this and was reprimanded by my company. So I have to say Mentor Graphics. I have to wear this. Um, I'm an embedded Linux architect at Mentor Graphics. And I've been involved in Linux for a while now. Um, the Octo project for a while now. I happen to be uh, also on the open embedded board. So, thank you. So I figured I would dive in a little bit as to why I, I wanted to do a follow up on this one. Um, the, the obvious reason is to provide an update on the talk and the, that I did in Dublin. Um, real quick, how many people here were at that talk? Oh, fair number, okay. So I used the, my talk from Dublin as a skeleton for this one, tried to change it up so that I'm not doing exactly the same talk with a little bit at the end. Um, hopefully I achieved that balance. But for those who hadn't seen this, I left some things in there to kind of give some background. Um, this is where the slides uh, from my previous presentation are. They're out there on elinux.org. Um, and of course the video is available on YouTube. And of course, I use part do for those who are familiar with um, American culture. It's a silly cultural reference. If you are curious about it, I'll tell you later. <laughs> so during this talk, I'm going to go ahead and go and describe the what and the why of shared logging. Um, I'm going to also give a little bit of history about where this feature came from. I'm not the original author, uh, or this isn't my, my brainchild. Um, what I did was took something that was existing and tried to revive it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the kernel logging structures. Um, for those of you who were in the talk in Dublin, this is pretty much the same outline. But as I said, I'm trying to keep it a little bit different. So, uh, And then I'll talk about the design and implementation that has evolved over time and has evolved since I gave the talk in Dublin. And then I'm going to do Q&A. Um, if you were looking for a live demo, unfortunately, my live demo suffered a live death. <laughs> so that's not going to happen today. Uh, and I apologize for that. So what is shared logging? Uh, it is very basic. Um, you know, the bootloader and the kernel are going to read and write log entries for themselves like they normally do. Uh, and then uh, they're also going to read log entries from each other. Um, they're also going to be able to read multiple boot cycles. So as uh, each one goes back and forth, they're going to be able to read multiple boot cycles from the other. And the bootloader also gets to dynamically specify a shared memory location that the kernel will use uh, in order to, to allow for this exchange of log entries. Um, this one is one that not everybody, I think, really grokked in the first presentation. So um, there's a few things about this that I want to kind of emphasize. The idea is that this is as dynamic as possible. Since this is a debug feature, or intended to be a debug feature, um, we want this to be able to move around uh, as much as possible. Um, in the final implementation, um, I envision this being something that you set with an environment variable in the uBoot command, um, and it will automatically um, go through that. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into it. So one of the other things that hopefully is fairly self-evident uh, is that in order for a bootloader to read kernel entries and to read multiple boot cycles, this is going to have to stay persistent in some way. Now, I'm not actually prescribing um, non-volatile RAM. Um, in fact, I'm not requiring anything other than a location in memory. Uh, so for multiple boot cycles or for being able to read them back and forth, it just needs to survive a reboot cycle. So a warm boot is fine. Uh, and most of the time, if you're hitting a reset button on your target um, or you trigger a CPU exception that causes a reset, um, you're going to still have contents of RAM. Now, that's not 100% guarantee. Um, so if you really need this to, to survive, then you might consider using something in non-volatile. Um, and one of the things that has come up a couple times is PStore. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that. I didn't in the last presentation. Um, that does provide a way to perhaps integrate with this. Right now, this feature doesn't currently integrate with that. 
So this one is also another question that I get a lot. Why would you want to have shared logging? Anybody have any ideas? The response is in the debug case where the kernel has gone south and you don't have a JTAG port uh, to be able to maybe get some sort of information back. And so, yeah, that is one of the primary use cases. Uh, I personally um, have a strong preference for JTAG debugging just because uh, I, my degrees are in computer engineering, but um, I have come around to the idea of, you know, logging is ubiquitous. Everybody uses it, they're very comfortable with it. And so I kind of put in a little tongue in cheek here. You know, imagine your life without logging and uh, how, you, how much you would scramble. So the idea is that we want to extend that. So the most common use case is a postmortem analysis of a failed boot. That could be a failed boot because the kernel crashes, that could be a failed boot uh, because the bootloader is doing something wonky. Um, your definition of failed boot is gonna be your own. Um, I've seen people define it as my peripherals didn't all come up. But this just gives you uh, a tool. So some other useful cases and the ones that actually generated this um, was when I was working on a, uh, a project where we were looking at increasing boot times. And we were wanting to look very closely at what was happening during the boot. So for performance tweaking, boot timing analysis, and also for looking at sequencing when we had things that we could reorder so that the long poles um, got started sooner. Um, and of course, just general boot and system debugging. It's not a silver bullet though. This isn't something, I'm not up here to tell you that you guys should abandon all other techniques. This is gonna be everything that fixes it for you. Um, it's really just something that's another tool. Put it in your toolbox, pull it out when you need it. This is actually kind of important though, is the when you need it. And I'll talk about that when I get into the design. But first, I had one or two people actually ask me about this. Um, this has been done before. This has been seen before. Again, I didn't come up with this original idea. Um, if you go back and get history, uh, you can actually see that in late 2002, uh, there was support added by Klaus Haydeck, that was the commit that I found, and U-Boot, um, that gave support for a shared memory buffer uh, that could be passed to the kernel. And this was gonna be used for, among other things, shared logging. As far as I could tell uh, from doing a little bit of, of kernel and uh, U-boot sleuthing, um, this was only supported on Dengst's kernel. It was never ported to the mainline. And it only, as far as I could tell, worked for PowerPC. This seems to have been really to allow the kernel to see the, the bootloader entries. There was no round trip. Uh, it was just really a one-way thing that allowed the, the bootloader to write something that the kernel could display. So a very simple use case. And this, and I asked this in Dublin, I'll ask you here, this does not appear to have been widely used. Has anybody heard of this before now that wasn't in my talk in Dublin? Let's see, that's sort of the, the uh, proof of that. So unfortunately, as things that aren't used tend to do. This, one, this feature suffered bit rot. Um, it didn't really receive a lot of adoption. It didn't really have any it, it updates very much after that point. Uh, and then uh, the kernel logging structures changed and made it a much more complicated affair. And so essentially this, this uh, capability died. So this is that question that I mentioned before. I've been asked about pstore and ram loops uh, several times in this context. This came up at Dublin. I didn't actually, I wasn't aware of, of pstore and ram loops uh, really at the time, so I went and did a little bit of, of digging. Um, these do seem to be significantly different in terms of the design goals. Um, is that a question? Or, no. Feel free to, to you know, Raise your hand, ask a question during the session. I tend to like to take them during the session uh, more than, although we try and collect them all at the end. Um, so they, they do appear to serve slightly different purposes. They both rely on very small pre-allocated regions of memory that makes them quite fixed. Um, however, I have not done the analysis to figure out how well we could maybe integrate them together. One suggestion that has been made was that perhaps pstore could be extended to understand the logging structures uh, and be used uh, to provide the actual non-volatile 
uh, capability that I mentioned before, which sounds like a good idea, but without having done a lot of looking at it, I can't say for sure. Um, and as I say here, this is certainly an area for future exploration. Um, one other thing sort of related to this was that uh, several people had pointed out that there didn't seem to be a real um, well-documented or, or uh, accepted method for passing chunks of memory between uh, the bootloader and the kernel um, with a specific semantic attached to it. There are mechanisms that sort of pass generic buffers, but no real context applied to them. Um, so this is maybe an additional extension of that. In, in other words, doing feature exploration to um, maybe provide that capability as we go forward. So this is, I should probably have, have led off with, this is sort of a side project for me. Um, my employer tolerates it to some extent, um, but they expect me to keep doing my, my regular job. So this has not made huge leaps since last year. It has made some, some progress. Um, so I plan to continue to toil on this for a while. Um, this is my opportunity to kind of ask you guys to do some talking. Does anybody know of any other features that I should be considering as I'm looking at this and looking to continue to extend it? MTD oops. to take a look at that. It's MTD oops, uh, probably similar to RAM oops. There's perhaps some opportunity here to go and kind of rationalize a few of these together and make them a little more consistent. Okay. Um, just for references for folks who are interested in learning a little bit more about PStore and what I did as a quick scan and about RAM oops, kernel documentation, of course. Um, so this is sort of the historical section. Um, this is important. I, I did go and spend a little bit more time than I did in Dublin to figure out exactly how far back um, the original kernel structure um, that changed uh, was. And I went back to my oldest, the first, literally the first git commit in my tree. I think it was um, either Linus or Greg KH did an import of uh, 2.6.11. Um, and it had the same byte index array. So it's, it's a very simple structure. It's basically a simple array of characters. Um, and then uh, it's got a couple, of, uh, a couple of indexes into it, one of them for start, one of them for stop, and one of them for console. Um, all of it was contained in printk.c, um, which is fairly, or is generic code. It's, it's non-arch specific. Um, this one becomes important later. Uh, the buffer is declared just as a static global inside the print k.c. Um, so that means that as soon as the C runtime is up, uh, it's available for use. So the first message that you usually see, the, the kernel banner, uh, is making use of the fact that that's available as soon as the runtime is available. I already covered that in terms of the indices. It's very simple, which made it very simple to support by a bootloader. Right? All you needed was the memory location and a couple of indices. And this is what it looked like. I made a mistake in Dublin. I tried to pull this up live, and that didn't work real well. So this, this right here is the actual allocation of the static buffer. Uh, and you can see down here is the, the start, the end. Um, there's a little counter for log characters. And then console start, which gives you an indication of where the actual console um, is at that point in time. Pretty straightforward, right? So then, in May of 2012, KSeavers um, posted a patch, or it was, I should say, it was merged, that changed the structure to a variable length record with a fixed header. Uh, and I'll show what that looks like in a sec. Um, everything was still contained in printk.c. In fact, it, there's comments to the effect of never put this into a header because we never want it exposed uh, to anybody else. This is only internal. Um, which is ironic because then there's some other stuff that isn't in the printk.c and, and isn't a printk.header. Um, it is still declared as static global. Again, it gets all those nice benefits of as soon as the C runtime is up, you're, you're good to go. Um, 
Um, it does include a timestamp, and the header is fixed. Um, we'll look at that. Fortunately, it's more complex. So there's more, there's more pointers for tracking. Uh, there's a sequence and an index for first, next, clear, syslog. Um, that complexity gives some additional functionality, which is useful, um, but you pay for it with complexity. So this right here, this print k under, excuse me, print k underbar log, is the actual structure, um, the header structure. You see the the u64 is the timestamp. Uh, has the length of the actual buffer. Um, it has the length of the text buffer, uh, and it has this provision for a uh, dictionary of key value pairs. I've never seen anything using this, um, but, oops, sorry. I've never seen anything using this um, yet, but I haven't gone really looking very hard for it. It's there, um, maybe that's useful, maybe it's not. It's a little bit of future proofing there. So all of this stuff is in here. You notice it's packed aligned. This will go away in my patch. In fact, it does, um, and I'll talk about why. This is the set of indices that I was talking about. You notice they're all statically declared, so they're, they're limited to file scope in, the, in this C compilation. This is in printk uh, dot C. Um, there's several of them. Um, as I said, there's a first, there's syslog, um, there's console, and there's clear. The most important ones for our purposes, for, for the sharing, uh, is actually, whoops, is actually the, uh, the first and the next. Um, coming out of the bootloader, it doesn't really have any concept right now, and I don't intend to add it, of the console in the same sense that the, that, uh, the, the kernel does, um, and no idea of, of syslog or clear. I'm a little fuzzy on what clear does anyway, um, to tell you the truth. So essentially, we really use the bare minimum in the bootloader, but we, again, we want to make sure it agrees. Pretty dry so far, right? So this is what it changed to. Um, and then I come along, uh, well, a few observations. Um, in order to allow a clean handoff, um, basically, um, the introduction of additional pointers made this more complicated. That's really what it comes down to. I've already covered this point, which is that the global declarations, the, the static declarations, makes it, come, uh, makes it available right away. Um, unfortunately, that also comes at a cost for sharing. Um, because those are just a bag of, of variables inside the printk.c, it makes it quite difficult to replace. Um, so one of the first things I have to do when I come into this uh, is replace that. I don't cover that in design goals, but um, these are the goals that I had coming in, um, and I've modified them slightly since last time. So the original focus was, uh, you know, getting the bootloader to write the format that the kernel understood. Um, sorry, I, I should be clear. The original focus of the feature was to get that bootloader to write um, the entries in such a way that the kernel could see them. Um, but it was not focused on a general mechanism for sharing. So I come along and I said, I, I want to do things a little bit different. Um, I want this to be available all the time because this is something that is one of those tools that you don't know when you're going to need it. I, don't, I want it to be in there and have almost no impact on boots uh, if you're not actively using it. Um, I also wanted it to be very, very portable. Print K itself is very portable. Um, because it relies on post C runtime um, initialization, it, it's pretty much agnostic to whatever the architecture is uh, that's run, that it's running on, which is great. Um, so I wanted to preserve that, and I added, I, I had forgotten to state that in, in uh, Dublin, which is why I bolded it here. And I also wanted to be portable across bootloaders, because you're talking about a really a clean divide between a bootloader and a kernel. Um, there's a clean handoff. So as long as you have a well-defined mechanism, um, there's no reason why core boot, you boot, um, take your flavor of boot, that, uh, you know, bootloader that you like, uh, shouldn't be able to write this. And that also makes it, again, more portable across architectures. Um, so I decided I would use U-boot since I was most familiar with it as a proof of concept. Um, and then I also wanted, and this one was another key, Point. I wanted to take some dynamic arbitrary location um, 
during runtime and assign it, essentially. But that has some complexity involved with it because some things have to shift dynamically. Um, I was really kind of hung up on this one. I, I don't know about anybody else, but uh, I, I come from you know pretty long history in the embedded space. So leaving memory on the table was always kind of verboten for me. It was it was something that I made me very itchy. So the fact that we had these global static allocations uh, was great from an initial being able to dump things, but it wasn't great from the perspective of now I'm leaving memory. And granted, it was I think like 16k. Um, but in my mind, 16K is still a lot of memory. Um, so this one, I really spent a lot of time and effort trying to get rid of. And every time I did, I ran smack into a wall. Um, and I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. But it's basically, you're fighting against portability when you do that. Um, the, another very important thing for me and something that I, I I'm very glad that I did early on was that because you're crossing the boundary between a bootloader and a kernel, you really need to make sure that this thing has a robust amount of uh, forward error correction. It's got to be able to receive something, look at it, and tell that it is not what it was expecting and be able to ditch it. Um, I said forward error correction. It's actually just error detection. The idea is that the bootloader may be out of date with your kernel or vice versa. So you may have one write of format that is perfectly OK at some point in time, but is no longer OK when you put these two together. That creates uh, a real opportunity for um, crashes. So uh, rather than have that happen, I put in a fair amount of additional data um, that would allow me to check and see, uh, at least do some sanity checking. I also wanted this to be very much an opt-in. I wanted it to be latent, but compiled in, and just a code path that wasn't taken until it was necessary. Vice versa, I also wanted it to be something that was very easy to disable, and it just disappeared. So hopefully I accomplished those goals. Um, I talked about this kind of already. In order to enable the kernel to replace all those indices, I had to create a structure that was easy to replace. Um, so I created this control block structure, which essentially was just a wrapper around all those static um, variables, uh, and then I redefine it uh, with, a, with a, a pointer that I can then replace. So as it says there, it takes all of these nice little logging pieces of information, collects them into a single struct, which is much easier than to replace. So it allows a single pointer to replace it. And then it also has the benefit of allowing the bootloader to pass a single parameter to the kernel. The other option, instead of doing this, would be to sort of pollute the command line with every single one of these values that the bootloader um, needed to be aware of and the kernel needed to be aware of. That would work, but I, I found it to be icky, <laughs> for lack of a better term. So I, I kind of consolidated this down to a single pointer, um, a single memory location that gets passed. The nice thing about that is that, in theory, um, this would allow the kernel to just simply replace one pointer um, and pick up and start running. So it's literally a, a, a 01 operation. The reality, unfortunately, is that there are some wrinkles to that. Um, and I'll talk about those. Still awake? <laughs> All right, so this is what the, this is what the, the structure starts to look like, or the, the first part of the structure looks like when modified. So config log buffer, excuse me, config log buffer um, is the, the feature that I added uh, in terms of kconfig to control this. Um, you'll notice that all I did in this case was I just added this magic number. That was that sanity check. So when you're spinning through memory, if this doesn't check, um, then you know that something went wrong and you uh, basically can reset to, you'll throw away log entries, but it's better than wandering off into memory and crashing your kernel. Um, this is that log control block that I've talked about. Um, you notice up at the top here is the pointer to the, to the buffer itself, the length of the buffer, and then all of these should look familiar because all they are is just cut and paste from earlier. And then this section right here is a little bit of that self-checking information that I was talking about. Uh, in particular, log version, um, the length of the padded size of this log control block, because it can be different um, and from the bootloader natively versus uh, the kernel due to padding and, and other issues. Um, 
the size of the structure itself, again, this is to help self-check. Uh, it's just redundant data. Um, the size of the header, which is basically um, that previous, sorry, in the wrong button, the, the previous structure here. So if any of these don't align, then when the kernel starts trying to parse this information that came from the bootloader, again, it's going to wander off into memory. Um, a physical address, because um, again, redundant information, but also due to the fact that the, the bootloader basically only looks at the physical address uh, and the kernel has at various points in time a physical or a virtual. And then another little magic number. So that's the structure. And from that, all other good things come. <laughs> that's as good, that's as funny as this talk's gonna get, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll do my best, but you know, this can be a bit of a dry topic. So then the question was, and this was probably the key, um, key technical challenge to this whole thing, was how to actually pass this control block into the, into the kernel. Um, so the first, the first pass at this was essentially uh, Dengs' pass, um, and it used a fixed well-known location. Um, when I picked this back up, I just started porting that forward to try and make it work with the new log structure. Um, it sort of worked. Um, but unfortunately, it was quite brittle, and I found out that depending on which platform I was, I was trying to do this on, um, the calculation didn't always work. So this relied on a, on a calculation at the top of memory um, that would differ in the bootloader versus the kernel. Um, the reason why it would differ in some cases was because as RAM sizes have gotten bigger um, and memory addresses um, became more scarce, you would actually sometimes have the kernel truncate its address space. So then when it calculated the location of the buffer, uh, it calculated based on the truncated RAM space. Uh, so maybe you had four gig of RAM um, and it would basically truncate it some amount and the bootloader wouldn't care. So it would take four gig and set it right at the top. Um, so this basically didn't always work and that made me unhappy. <laughs> so the next approach um, was to use the command line. This is stuff that I covered in Dublin. Um, so command line variable, um, and I tried to pass almost everything on there. Uh, it is, of course, very flexible and allows for the, dy the dynamic setting that I was looking for. Um, there is a small performance hit that's going to occur um, because of how and when the command line is parsed. Um, it's tied, it's an or order uh, n operation because it's tied to the number of entries that exist in the bootloader and the kernel at the time that you do this, um, what a coalescing operation. Um, I kind of preferred this approach, except that I kept running into certain, certain issues with the reservation of memory. And that also drove me to some things that uh, were not uh, completely arch uh, portable. I also had some concern having some conversations in ELC, um, two years ago, um, when I, I talked to a couple of maintainers about this because uh, I was curious to, to whether or not they would take that approach and they weren't super enthralled with the idea um, because there was both multiple uh, parameters and because they don't like things being thrown on the command line. Um, so there was some question in my mind as to how acceptable it was going to be. Um, moving forward, since then, so this is, um, a, well, sorry, I actually then moved on to device tree based on that. This was the version two. Um, I tried to shove everything into the DT itself. Um, at the time, I, there was not, uh, I w or I was not as familiar with um, the dynamic FDT uh, command inside U-boot uh, to, to use um, and modify a, a DT. Also, I was working against a slightly older kernel when I presented this in Dublin. So we're getting kind of an intermediate here. Um, essentially, uh, this used the open firmware functions to extract information for the DT. Um, I personally found this a bit difficult to work with. Uh, there's not as much uh, information about using OF and early init. Um, and it just, again, it sort of made me itchy. I didn't like what was happening when I, when I went down this approach. You still have the log coalescing, um, unfortunately, um, it seemed like, uh, though I never did uh, do hard numbers on this, that it happened a little bit sooner, so there was less of a hit, so there was fewer entries. Um, but ultimately, um, 
I still wasn't overly happy with this. It was, however, perhaps a little bit more acceptable. So then we move to today. Um, what I have found is when I did a port to mainline, um, I saw that I could make use of the DT and the command line in a combined way uh, that allowed me to uh, maybe leverage both uh, in a better way. So in particular, I'm, using, I'm relying on the bootloader now. This is implicit in this, that the bootloader, any other bootloader uh, that doesn't have the dynamic capability for the FDT may have to fail back to uh, a fixed DT to do this. But um, I'm now relying on the reserve memory areas and the DT to leverage the infrastructure inside the kernel to just reserve that memory and, and do the right thing so that you don't have to worry about it. Um, the nice thing about a new boot is that when you specify this um, in U-boot on the command line, um, it also reserves it for U-boot. Um, so now you've got both section, both the kernel and U-boot that are reserving this memory so it doesn't, you don't have to worry about it. So that took care of one of the biggest thorns on my side. Um, it also allowed me to avoid any platform specific call, uh, code at all, which primarily was around memory reservation, uh, and certainly in the kernel. Um, as I say here, that in the, the U-boot case, this utilizes the FDT features that are available um, today. I don't know how far back those go. Um, this is a forward-looking feature, so if you're looking, it could potentially be backported, or you could again fail back to just writing a, a DT manually. You're getting less of the dynamic nature of it, but I've already covered this point. There still is going to be some log coalescing, um, and it does rely on the command line parameter to specify the, just the single memory location uh, for the control buffer, which is, I think, acceptable. Yes? Does this not work at all then on uh, multi-DT architectures like uh, x86? It's a good question. So the question was, does this not work at all on architectures that uh, don't use DT? Um, I'm hemming and hawing up here because um, technically the, the implementation doesn't care how the reservation occurs as long as the kernel doesn't step on itself um, trying to access memory uh, or the bootloader doesn't. So, uh, and I'm not as familiar with um, you know, EFI and, and x86 as far as how it can do memory reservation, but I believe there's capability there. I did have a conversation with somebody about core boot, and they do say that there's a way to do this as well that would be very similar. Um, so the answer is I think that it should still work. Uh, it just may have to take a slightly different path in order to do the memory reservation. What I found was that I ran into more problems trying to do a portable version of memory re reservation than anything else. Um, I do have some ideas on ways that I might go back to using the open firmware functions early in boot um, to extract uh, a couple of small values that might make that go away. Um, that's in my future looking slide at the end. Um, but it's a good question. Again, my whole goal with this is to try and make it as portable as possible. Um, but there is unfortunately implicit in this a fair amount of work leveraged um, or imposed on the bootloader to make it work. The kernel already had the infrastructure in place to, to display the messages, much more robust uh, log capability. So um, I didn't want to perturb that, and I perceived that it would be easier to modify the bootloader. That may not be the case. We'll see. Um, but moving on then. Um, you know, the, one of the nicest things that I found about uh, um, U-Boot um, well, first of all, it, it basically had a very different, um, a very simplified version of the the, uh, the logging. When I looked at what had what was present after 2012 with K's um, logging uh, patch, and what was at that point in time in U-Boot, uh, they were quite different. But U-Boot has implicitly already the concept of a version log format. It had a V1 and a V2, which made it very simple um, for me to just extend that capability to add a new version of it, um, which also made it very easy for me to make it a, a, a divertible path. So if you didn't want to use the V3 structure, it just simply took the V2. Um, so then this is why I introduced a new format. 
Um, and it just happened to be the same as the kernel. <laughs> Convenient for me. So uh, in Dublin, I talked about using several uh, U-boot environment variables, maybe too many, um, to try and control this. I've dropped much of these uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of cheating in some of my slides ahead here, but uh, in particular, what I found was that uh, during boot, some of these environment variables weren't quite um, as reliable as I had thought they would be. Um, they were subject to initial, um, uh, initial boot conditions when you had a clean system that had never had an environment before and it was actually writing a default environment. Uh, I also found that uh, on occasion, if I read a value too early, I would get the default. If I then went back and read it again, I would get an alternate, um, which meant that I couldn't quite rely on them as much as I had. So I pulled most of these out for now, um, and I, I'll talk a little bit more about what I hope to do with that uh, moving forward. So the bootloader upstream status. Uh, I did, uh, since last time, port it to mainline, which was actually a lot easier uh, code-wise than I expected. Um, there is unfortunately still some cleanup and refactoring. Um, there's some additional features in here that kind of crept in. Um, another uh, coworker of mine uh, suggested some improvements and, and gave me some patches that I'm gonna have to uh, kind of rework to make it acceptable, which means that unfortunately it's not submitted upstream as of yet for the bootloader. On the kernel side, um, I did relocate all of the stuff into that code, that um, control block, as I said. Uh, and I also added support for uh, repointing that control block um, based on um, the inbound uh, command line parameter. Um, this one's kind of obvious here. I don't know why I have it. Basically, during command line processing, the values uh, are pulled in and captured. Um, there's not really that many of them. Um, and then uh, this is kind of important, and this, this is where I maybe I'll take a moment to describe why there is coalescing recurring. Um, during, the, during the initialization of the, of the system, um, memory initialization occurs uh, approximately around mm and it. Um, the actual call that sets this thing up, the, the external buffer, is this setup ext log buff. Um, it actually halts temporarily because at that point in time, because of the fact that that global static existed, the kernel has, felt, has been free to write a whole bunch of entries. I say a whole bunch. A fair number of entries, some 10, less than 100, I think, in most cases, entries into the, to the log. Um, and then when we hit this point in time, you have an unknown number of entries that may or may not have been written from the bootloader. You have an unknown number of entries that may have been written by the, the kernel. And if you've done multiple boot cycles, then that problem gets a little bit worse over time. Um, so what's going to happen is that the logic of this is going to halt at that point and combine those into the, um, the combined region. Um, everybody following me on that point? Okay. Everybody. Essentially, yeah. So I cannot, I can't rely on having access to that buffer um, until uh, this this function occurs, and this occurs late enough that there are some some value or some log entries in there already. Um, one thing I may have, I don't know if I made this clear. The, so if you've got that chunk of RAM that you've been writing multiple boot entries into, that's going to get longer and longer. That impact is not going to, that, that length isn't going to impact the amount of time it takes to copy over. It's only amount of entries that have gone into the kernel specific global static, which is going to be generally pretty fixed. If you're doing, unless you're, I can't think of a case in which this wouldn't be the case. Um, it's pretty much going to be fixed every time. Um, you're going to have roughly 10 to 100, somewhere in that range. Um, yes? Isn't this coalescing just a memory copy? Or what? Unfortunately, it's not. Um, I, I did look at that, and I, was, I thought, oh, well, I should be able to just do two copies of these things. Um, and there may be a more algorithmically um, uh, sound way to do this. What I did, I went for correctness in this case. Because these are variable records and because they can wrap, it's a ring buffer, um, there's no telling exactly where you are at any given point uh, in the bootloader uh, or the shared buffer um, when you come to the point where you're going to copy over the kernel. 
There's also no restriction right now on the size. So if the shared buffer is smaller um, than the kernel buffer, then you're going to almost certainly have wrapped. You have multiple boot entries and things like this. So um, I think in the back of my head that there should be a way for me to, to simplify it. Right now, it does a record by record copy uh, to ensure correctness. Um, I, I suspect that I could probably do something that would be maybe two or three copies. But it, it's, I make a big deal out of this. Like I said, it, it just offends my sense of, of uh, you know, efficiency. I would have preferred to be able to get to that pointer early enough so that the first print from the, from the kernel uh, lands in that shared buffer, in which case there's no need to do any copy. It just takes that buffer and runs. I haven't gotten to that point yet. So the upstream status. So the refactoring of the code since last time, I, I managed to drop out all the Arch-specific code, which was nice. All of that was really related to the memory, um, the memory reservation and sharing. Um, pretty much almost all of the changes are located in printk.h or printk.c. Uh, which is kind of nice from just a cleanliness perspective. There are basically two exceptions to that. There's kconfig in order to add the option in, uh, and then the actual setup ext logbuff uh, call in main.c. I submitted these um, to LKML for those who can read dates. That was not that long ago. Um, if you're looking for these, I don't know. I forgot to add the date there. So this is sort of a cautionary tale. Um, <laughs> I meant to put the date up. I think I submitted this on, uh, as I said, 10.04. And I think that I resubmitted V2 without any prompting from anybody on, on uh, 08. And that was because I had to go and check some things. What happened was, <laughs> as soon as I sent it in, about 10 minutes later, I got an email, a very polite email, from the kernelci.org that it had failed. <laughs> I was so pleased. My first patch and I had managed to fail in 15 minutes. <laughs> what had happened was I had tested very carefully turning my feature on and off, on and off, and made sure it worked on the different targets that I was building for and everything else. But what I did not do was turn off printk itself. <laughs> and as it turns out, I had moved something outside of one of those pound if defs inappropriately. I had to relocate it inside. And but yeah, I was a little embarrassed by that. Uh, so the V2 came out like three or four days later. I meant to put the date up here. Um, and you'll notice that on, uh, on my little GitHub link here, uh, I, I've got a V2 there. Uh, there's also a V1. So a good cautionary tale. Um, oh, I don't know why that one came out of order. Um, this got ported. I, I decided just arbitrarily to, uh, to port this to the mainline kernel. Uh, at that point in time, it was 4.8. Um, so, uh, to be honest, the part of the, the uh, impetus for this and finally making me get off my duff and, and do this was because I knew I was going to present on this, so I should actually have this submitted upstream. So these, I've talked through some of these already, um, but again, I, I, I just I want to emphasize some of them. Um, physical versus virtual addressing, most of us are aware of this. It's something that we all kind of keep in the back of our head. Um, however, Bootloader, bootloader uses physical, the kernel uses both. It depends on where you are in the code. Even though I knew this, I managed to hurt myself several times on this. So that's part of the reason why I had that additional information in the, the log structure um, and that um, LCB block, because I used that to tell myself, am I really using the right address? Um, and ironically, I was using logging itself to help me with this. Um, so this one was another really key pain point for me, uh, the mapped memory versus unmapped memory. When you first get into the kernel C runtime, you think everything's hunky-dory, all your memory is present. That's not true. Um, you actually have to map stuff in. Some things happen automatically. And the command line is one of those. So when I went back and I was using that DT uh, approach, pure DT approach, hey, I have my command line, so I'm, I'm up and running. I've got all my memory, right? Nope. Um, so this one, this one actually cost me quite a bit, and the good news is I learned a fair amount out of it, um, but uh, uh, just be aware of this whenever you're looking at stuff that's going across these boundaries, certainly early kernel uh, and then. Um, uh, 
make absolutely sure that you know what, where your memory is and that it's mapped in when you go to attempt to address it because the most common behavior for, that I found when you get into the situation is the kernel just stops. Nothing, no oops, nothing else. It just goes and it's gone. Um, that's the technical term. Um, one of the other things that, again, this is, this is like the, the CS 101, structure packing. So it, for years, uh, I've known this, um, compilers are free to pack structures in, in unique ways. There's no real um, reliable uh, way to know that it's going to do it. Um, pay attention to your structure packing. As it turns out, I was using initially, um, I forget which version of GCC when I was doing it, it worked fine. The packing all agreed, everything was cool. Alignment was good. Um, I migrated forward uh, and, and updated my compile and tool chain. All of a sudden, the code hadn't changed. Um, the patch applied cleanly. Everything compiled and nothing worked. Uh, and as it turns out, the alignment of the structure, the, the packing itself of the structure, um, was, was bad. So that line that I highlighted before that aligned by four and packed, that I, that I pulled out, that was part of it. And also I had to manually pack um, the, the struct itself in order to make it happy. So uh, one other little tip on that, um, there's a lot of variability when you have a large U64. Um, and so how that gets handled, in particular, how subsequent fields get handled can be different. Um, or if you have it at the end, uh, that seemed to be the most problematic. No, that's exactly right. Basically, if you look in the C standard, um, you know, it says this quite explicitly in almost every book um, that you, you read about C programming. Bit packing um, in a structure uh, is terribly non-portable and the actual packing of the structure itself. Um, so just pay attention to that, uh, especially in this case, we're doing something that is crossing conceptually, you know, the boundary, even though it's the same processor, um, you've got a, a bootloader uh, that looks at it one way and then a kernel looks at it another, and this turned out to be very problematic for me. Um, one of the other things I learned uh, was that messing around in early init and uh, in, in init itself uh, is quite fraught with peril, and they are just quiet failures. Um, you know, I, I can't... I can't I kept finding myself, you know, going, what's it doing? It, there's a definition of insanity that you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So it would hang and i go, reset. <laughs> it would hang again and i go, reset. And I'd usually stop after three and go, damn it. And my first inclination was, if only I had logging around, then I could figure out what was going on. And then I would kick myself violently and go get something to drink. Um, so yeah, just be aware that anytime you do this, um, there's a whole lot of this stuff that is very fragile. Um, it's people have sort of got it working and then they backed away from it and they don't touch it if they don't have to. Um, so have a strong constitution if you're going to do that. Um, I'm going to need some chuckles. I'm getting you guys awake anyway. Um, porting to mainline. Um, as I said, uh, you know, the patches themselves actually ported pretty easily. Um, most, uh, most of it really compiled pretty easily, too. Um, that, was, that was nice. That really isn't a gotcha. Um, unfortunately, this is a gotcha when you go, great, I'm done. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're not done. Um, so this can give you a false sense of, of success, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, in my particular case, one other little surprising gotcha. So all of that stuff about reserve memory, everything that I told you, I had figured out that you know, I had a, a, a solution that worked, right? I had a place to, that I could reserve memory in and everything else. I passed in my reserve memory region and it was working fine in the older kernel. Uh, and the newer kernel, things stopped working. And back to the quiet failure. If only I had logging, I would be able to figure it out. Um, eventually, I actually turned on, um, um, I did end up using logging to find this. Uh, ironically, uh, I disabled my own feature and I turned on mm and debug and was able to find out that the memory region that I had selected was unfortunately somehow being reserved by something else. And it was just quietly you know, dying um, because of that. So all I did was 
and this was where the dynamic uh, side of things worked in my favor, all I did was change that one address um, and things started working magically and I did a little happy dance. So um, one of the other things, I've talked a little bit about this, um, building can itself because of tool chains can be a problem. I really, really wanted to have uh, the working demo, so I spent a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of time trying to get my x86 U-boot to work, and that has been unfortunately non-trivial. I've got some folks that are swearing that they're going to help me after the you know ELCE. So by the next time I, I post anything on this, I plan to have an x86 minnow board um, and my uh, my wand board working uh, to show this across two different arches. Um, this one actually, I, I'm a Yocto guy, if you guys don't know that, I'm open embedded as I said. Uh, so this one was surprising to me how much of a pain in the butt it was uh, to try and use a mainline kernel um, and a mainline uh, U-boot because of the fact that uh, every distribution that I was using inside Yocto was really trying to grab hold of the kernel and really trying to grab hold of the uh, the U-boot that it was using. So this created a significant uh, challenge for me. Um, and as I said here, <laughs> it was about 10 minutes. <laughs> so um, clearly I didn't test well enough. Uh, I really, it never occurred to me that I should disable printf uh, itself entirely to see if my patch worked, but so just cautionary tale. Um, and I already explained that part. So planned and future, uh, well, planned and possible future work. Um, I need to obviously clean up the, the U-boot patches so the proof of concept is complete and people can play with it. Um, I expect to do that fairly soon. Um, I say fairly soon because last time in Dublin I said, I'll have this done by the end of the year and here we are almost a year later. Um, so uh, I really want to get this working for, for x86 so that we can see what it looks like. Um, instead of U-boot, uh, I, I may also, and I think I put this in here, I may look at uh, core boot. I was asked several times by people who were asking me about this session about this. This is, goes back to, to your question earlier. The OF extraction of the LCB pointer, um, now that I'm more familiar and I've, I've done this a few times, um, it might be possible using that DT combination with the command line and the OF uh, extraction to maybe do away with some of that uh, need for coalescing. I'm in the back of my head an idea and I need to go try it out and see what's gonna happen there. Um, because you, OF functions are available, uh, actually, if you know what you're doing, they're available before C runtime comes up. So in order to ensure that the, you get the same behavior of the buffer um, before the C runtime comes up, uh, then you would need to do it uh, in, in one of those early, early um, uh, init sections. If I can do that in a portable way, it's going to be a challenge. One of the other things that nobody uh, asked, has asked about is um, a time base. Right now, um, the timer resets every time you reset. So we really want to find, I really want to find a way so you have a single time base and you can actually just see it kind of continuously incrementing. This is uh, much more useful for tracing instead of trying to find some, uh, some uh, marker in your trace file that says this is the start of a new boot. Um, this one is one that I've, I've really been thinking a lot about. So the environmental settings uh, in U-Boot, because of their instability uh, uh, in terms of being able to read them, I kind of moved away from them. But one thing that I also was hoping to be able to do was if I'm sitting there at my U-Boot uh, console and I set uh, set EMV LCB physical underbar address, um, I'm, I want it to actually relocate the U-Boot the log itself. Currently, I don't know of any example where setting an environment variable triggers that kind of a change, um, but that would be, you I, know when? I added support for that about five years ago. Then I, I knew I came to the right place. And the good news is you live in my town, so. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to I want to pick your brain about how to do that. Um, core boot, as I said, and then we are into the tail end. So again, I apologize for no demo. I really wanted to have that one working, but sadly that was not going to happen. Questions? I think we are maybe a couple minutes over, but.
maybe not a question, but to extend on the COVID stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So <coughs> the COVID guys, they had the same problems to get um, the logs. And there's also this payload concept. So they also want to get the logs from the payload. And so they, I think they didn't go the path to, to um, get it shared in the um, kernel buffer, um, a logging buffer. But they just reserve um, memory themselves called COVID memory, CD memory. In there, they can store several information, and one is the CB mem console, hmm. and they um, yeah just have like a marker which they then look for in memory, and then they have a utility called a CB mem on console, uh, which you can run on the console, which finds this marker and then prints out the information there. They can also store timestamp information and so on, and then only in the Chromium uh, OS repository there is a Linux kernel driver, which also exposes this over the slash sys. But maybe it's probably more interesting to also get into an approach where Linux can, by default, without any driver, access it. But no idea why they didn't go to this path. Probably because it was easier. Maybe because it was a loadable module. Um, they could do it that way. Um, so for those who may not have heard it, um, Coreboot has a similar functionality in terms of a, uh, a reserve memory um, that uh, has a kernel uh, driver that they can use to access and also has a command to dump it. Um, so that's certainly something that I'm going to need to look at to, to try and combine uh, with if I can, if I could for a, a core boot uh, implementation. Any other questions? Thank you very much.